Hello and uh, greetings from uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. Welcome to the first uh, Georgian-Norwegian Nordic Talks brought to you by Caucasian Journal. My name is Alexander Kafka. I'm editor-in-chief of Caucasian Journal. And um, I wish to thank the Nordic Council of Ministers for supporting our event. We are talking about uh, two countries, uh, Norway and Georgia, which are called hydropower countries because they both countries have uh, a lot of natural resources which are good uh, for hydropower generation. And these countries uh, have uh, exchange programs in education, engineering. Uh, we talk about the usefulness of those programs and especially about things which can and should be improved. I start with our Georgian uh, speaker, Nani Medashvili, Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of uh, Georgia. Hello, everyone. I'm Chief Specialist at the Division of uh, International Relations in Energy Sector. I had the opportunity to see how our cooperation has returned into friendship, uh, which continues. We have already seen a lot of progress and um, there is more to come in the future. I would uh, now give floor to your Norwegian counterpart, Kirsten Vestgaard. Uh, who works for the Norwegian Ministry. We are a government agency under the Ministry for Energy in Norway. It's not that we have uh, the solutions always, but maybe you can learn from some of our experiences, both good and bad. Our other uh, distinguished guest from uh, uh, Norway is uh, Lina Blut Hagen, Managing Director of the International Center for Hydropower. Thank you so much. Um, my name is uh, Lina Hagen. We are an uh, educational uh, organization, a membership-based organization, uh, doing short-term courses uh, in the area of, of hydropower. Professor Murman Margvelashvili from Ilya University in, in Georgia. We have multidisciplinary probably the uh, program in Ilya State University. It is called Energy Management and Sustainable Development. So we have uh, the courses both in uh, energy technologies and environmental, economic and political fields. Professor Otbjorn Bruland. Yeah, I am representing NTNU, the Norwegian University of Technology and Science. Norway is quite a small nation in the world, but when it comes to hydropower production, we are number six in the world and we are the largest in Europe. One of the main, main key things that we developed here was the tunneling system and the underground power station. And that was one of the strengths that was the basis for uh, the education program that we have here at NTNU in hydropower development. This program was, um, it's a two year master program. I think it's the only one in the world. We are really happy to have this um, collaboration now with Georgia and the experience so far with these students that they are very clever and very engaged. So we are very happy to have them here. Anybody of our other guests would like to introduce themselves? Well, I'm from Georgia, but currently I'm in Sweden um, doing my master's course in uh, organizational leadership and societal challenges. And what I see in Georgia is that there is such a lack of uh, cross-sectoral collaboration. As I learned about this event today, I thought maybe I can learn something more about this topic. I'm Shalwa Abramishvili. I'm a geographer, geologist, uh, and uh, I'm a student in uh, Georgian State University. And generally, I'm interested in hydropower and uh, sustainable development of this field. Let me start with a, a very general uh, question. I call it a science fiction uh, question. And let's imagine a world uh, where all the energy is generated uh, from hydropower. What should it look like? Alina Blut Hagen? For a hydropower fan like me, um, this sounds like a dream scenario. Um, and we would probably not be faced with the climate change problems that we see today. On the other hand, we would certainly run into a series of other problems. Uh, development of hydropower can, if not done right, 
be the source of serious conflicts and the destruction of nature, habitats, and livelihoods. And uh, here we are at the core. Uh, sustainable development of hydropower is crucial. We must be able to stop the development if the impact assessment studies shows that it's impossible to develop a site in a sustainable manner. And with sustainable, I mean uh, both environmentally, socially, and economically. On the other hand, done right, hydropower is a wonderful source of energy. It's clean, it can provide energy storage, all ranging from milliseconds to years. It can provide support to other more intermittent energy sources like wind and solar. And it's distributed, as long as, of course, you have a river available. Uh, the technology is not too complex either, and the infrastructure lasts almost forever. Kirsten Vestgaard. In my opinion, this image of a world where most of the energy is hydropower raises more questions than answers. The distribution of water resources on a global level is so unfair. How do we manage that? The distribution of people is so inconvenient. Some areas are scarcely populated, some have high density, and very few live near the hydropower production site. This means that we need power lines, transmission, distribution. What about the effect on climate change? Hydropower is among the cleanest sources of electricity with a low greenhouse gas emission intensity. Hydro has some advantages. If it has reservoirs, the stored water functions as green batteries. Hydropower is an ideal complement to variable renewables like wind and solar, thanks to its flexibility and energy storage services. No country has come close to achieving 100% renewables without hydropower in the energy mix. Professor Murman Marguelashvili. I think it would be much better because then it would uh, create a great protection against climate change. Uh, water availability in many, many areas, that is a problem now, uh, for irrigation, for potable water, for other uses, and it would be, uh, to my understanding, a much better world. That would also uh, allow incorporating a lot of solar and wind power into the system, and that would allow completely to get a, a rid of uh, fossil fuels and preserve our world. Professor Otbjorn Bruland. In a science fiction world, I would say hydropower could solve any of the energy problems that the world experiences today. Then I would ask for a glass of dry martini, shaken but not stirred. The unexploited potential of hydropower is large, enormous. And with unlimited resources and technologies, like in a Bond movie. We could develop this in a sustainable and synergetic way, both for the humanity and for the environment. Nani uh, Medashvili. Science fiction has one thing in common. It becomes a reality over time. <laughs> I hope it will be <laughs> true for Georgia. First of all, hydropower is a better uh, for the environment. Uh, environment changing hydrological flow regimes, um, destroying water quality, um, even migration corridors, barriers, and uh, green greenhouse gas emission and um, other things. I don't know, there's a lot of bad things about the hydropower plants, um, are impacts of hydropower plants, but it is still better future than, um, different future with, I don't know, with uh, oil and gas, which use uh, Georgia use now. So I think hydropower energy is still better world 
uh, than it is now. I think the, this science fiction is a better future for, for the world, not only for the Georgia. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Clean energy is good, but um, we also know that uh, hydropower plants may be affecting the land use of people like homes and natural habitats in the dam areas, right? And so the discussion needs also to be about how we are um, overcoming it. Kirsten Vestgaard. I think uh, it's interesting for you to know that we have uh, unharvested hydropower potential because our prime minister for uh, uh, I don't know how many years it's since uh, 10 or 20 years ago he said we will not uh, develop more big hydropower in Norway it's it's enough now and so that's why we have looked at other sources for instance wind power but that has created a new kinds of uh, conflicts and uh, discussions Lina? To be sure not to run into big problems while developing hydropower, then you need um, you need to have this uh, local involvement and local um, uh, uh, the benefit sharing, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, I would also say that uh, from the Norwegian perspective, uh, we were very fortunate uh, 100, 100 years ago that we had some politicians that were really foresighted and and uh, put together laws and regulations that secured these mechanisms, that they secured the benefit sharing, they secured uh, that uh, the um, ownership of the waterfalls and the, the rights of the waterfall were not sold in, indefinitely uh, over time. It was sold with a, with a time limit so that uh, future generations had the opportunity to, to get, the, um, get the rights back. The United Nations has prioritized clean energy as a fundamental SDG. Is this a powerful stimulus? What other steps are needed? Kirsten Vestgaard? I have to say yes. I think the SDGs form a powerful stimulus. First and foremost, because we tend to focus on whatever is measured. And with the SDGs, we have a common ground as to what and how we measure. An example is energy, the Energy Progress Report. I think hydropower is part of the solution both to balance intermittent power, such as wind and solar, but also to balance a robust uh, power system, which is essential in modern energy services. We need to both expand infrastructure and upgrade technology for supplying modern and sustainable energy services for all. There is no doubt in my mind that energy and specifically clean energy is fundamental for development. Uh, it's necessary to secure education and for business development, but it's also all important for basic needs such as food and security. And uh, also as the UN says themselves, energy is central for nearly every challenge and opportunity. The fact that clean energy has been highlighted as a sustainable development goal is important, but I don't find it as a decisive stimulus. What has been decisive though the last years is the massive decrease in cost per kilowatt hours for renewable energies and for batteries. Now renewable energies can compete with coal, oil and gas in almost every instance. The decrease cannot last forever though, but as far as uh, now it has an immense impact on the introduction of renewable energy in the energy mix. Some countries are lucky to have more hydro resources than others. What would you like to emphasize from the Norway's experience? Lina Blodhagen. For Norway, hydropower was crucial for the development from a poor, predominantly agricultural society at the turn of the last century to the wealthy industrial society we have today. Of course, the fact that uh, we somehow found the huge amounts of oil and gas uh, at the Norwegian shelf in the late 1960s had some impact too, 
but um, nevertheless, hydropower was important. But it was the foresight of a few Norwegian politicians at that time that really made a difference. They saw that Norwegian rivers and waterfalls were sold to industrial actors at a large scale. Uh, and they hurried to adopt laws and regulations that secured uh, that some of the revenues remained in the regions. This is uh, early benefit sharing, uh, as we might call it. Furthermore, they put in regulations um, that secured the return of the waterfalls uh, to the state after a period of 100 years. In that way, future generations were given the uh, opportunity to make their own decisions on how to manage the natural resources. I think this kind of thinking is key. Hydropower development, as I already mentioned, often has big implications for the people that live in the area, valuable nature, habitats, and livelihood may be lost. If these concerns are not considered, uh, the companies developing the sites lose their license to operate. And eventually uh, the development will come to a halt. That said, Norway is by no means in the clear. Uh, since the 1970s, we have seen political unrest because of land hydropower plants and more recently wind parks. We continuously must strive towards the highest standards when it comes to social and environmental issues. Kirsten Vestgaard. In my opinion, development of hydropower should take into account two basic principles. One is that the natural resources of a country, such as the water resources, belong to the people who live there. This means that the decision-making process must be democratic and transparent. Also, I think some of the profit from hydropower development should go back to the people of the country. This can happen through taxation or different kinds of benefit sharing. There should be some differentiation so those who are directly affected get a reasonable compensation for the inconvenience the project creates. The second basic principle is that the investors and developers should have an even playing field. I think that all aspects of developing a hydropower project should be regulated with the basis in national legislation. This means that the same rules and regulations apply to everyone. It also gives the government the authority to ensure viable and sustainable solutions. It does create some red tape, but I'm convinced that this pays off in the long run. Professor Odbjorn Bruland. Through the 18th century, Norway developed from being an undeveloped country in Europe to in the end becoming in the front of development. And hydropower was a key factor. The development of subsurface power station with water supply from complex water collecting tunnel systems became the Norwegian way, the Norwegian method and the Norwegian strength. This, this is some of the knowledges that we wanted to share through our educational program. But the extensive development of hydropower in Norway created also large, huge environmental concerns and resistance. And over the last decades, huge, huge efforts have been put into research on environmental friendly development of hydropower and also, also better environmental impact assessment methods and water resource management. This is maybe the most important thing that we at the moment have and we like to share with our students. If we talk about future, the young people's mentality and the education quality are the keys. And in this regard, what's the role of your organization? Lina uh, My organization, International Center for Hydropower, is a not-for-profit membership-based entity working out of Trondheim, uh, Norway. I'm the managing director, and uh, with me I have a staff of four. 
In addition, we have a pool of about 100 expert lecturers and resource persons that we can draw from in our courses. Our main ob objective is to raise the standard of competence of industry personnel by organizing intensive training courses in the field of hydropower and renewable energy sources. We work in Africa, uh, Latin America, Asia, Norway, and Georgia. We are specifically targeting women as we see that they are often, that they often have the uh, potential of being agents of change in their organization. And we are targeting young professionals uh, because we are aware of the importance of installing good practices early. It is the youngsters that will be faced with the consequences of climate change, but they are also the ones that can make the change. How would you evaluate the efficiency of Norway's university exchange in your field? What can be improved? Professor Otbjorn Bruland. The interest in the hydropower development program is very high. And it attracts many, many students that is very, very clever. But the challenge is that the mass, the mass of these applications is from few, few countries. As the main advertising of the program is through the world of mouth. But there are also many other countries that probably have an equally high and maybe higher need of hydropower engineers. And this gap we would like to fill. I think we have some students from the program here, so I would, it would be nice to hear from them. Yeah. Hi, Very well, I'm, Levan. <laughs> Hi, Levan my name is Levan. Uh, I'm a student. Uh, I'm in the first year of the master's uh, program. My experiences have been very positive. I'd worked in the field for a couple of years before I arrived at NTNU. And um, I had an idea of what knowledge I was missing. It's exactly the thing I needed. And it's the only place that offered the exact thing I needed. Professor Murman Margvelashvili. Uh, I have to make it clear that we, uh, our, I'm coming from Ilya State University and we are not yet included in this program, although we probably will be very happy to, to see some uh, opportunities for cooperation. I want very much the young people like Levan to be definitely coming to Georgia and working here and sharing their knowledge. We would be very glad to invite them for lectures to create special courses in order that they share further their knowledge. Because uh, one problem or another problem we are facing here is kind of brain drain. And we still uh, are left without a critical mass of professionals here. One way of addressing this thing uh, might be to uh, think maybe if it is possible in any, to establish kind of a joint program so that it's not only one person coming, but to create kind of a ongoing process here in Georgia to have a joint program where we would have quality uh, courses given to students here Maybe Norwegian uh, professors coming for some short period uh, assignment to give the lectures or educate local uh, professors and involve them in, in, in quality teaching and uh, to arrange also a competition between local universities so that we really choose the best. Kirsten Westgaard. In Norway, uh, we do not have uh, tuition on the universities. So the scholarship uh, provides uh, cost uh, or cover costs for living expenses. And this means that if you apply to NTNU and you get accepted uh, and you have and you can finance uh, the living expenses yourself, it's uh, open to for application to everybody is there any requirement uh, in the current exchange programs that the uh, students are obliged to, to go back to their home countries professor Otbjorn Bruland the students 
in the hydropower development program are usually very highly motivated. I remember one girl from Uganda. She prioritized the education so high that she left a three month old baby to her grandmother's caring while she carried out her studies here. We also conducted a study of how many that went back to their original country to exploit their knowledge to the benefit of their home country. We found this to be about 65 percentage. About 17 percentage stayed back in Norway after the finishing their master thesis to continue their education into a PhD or into another field of competence. To work, to work with such engaged students, that is some of the most motivating jobs you can have. And also to promote clean energy development, development in a sustainable way to such students, that makes the day even better. Nana, Nana Medashvili, please. We need to go specialist. This is the reason why we started the program. So it's about to help Georgia get qualified specialists in this uh, sector. So main uh, reason why we are uh, why they are funding students and why we are helping students to go to Norway is that they come to Georgia and we will uh, guarantee them uh, good uh, quality jobs. Professor Murman Margvelashvili. Just to return to my to my suggestion, along with sending people for, from here to Norway, maybe it would be possible also bring some people from Norway here. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Westgard. I can say that the, the last idea that came up, I think that's a very good idea and we can discuss that further. I'm happy that we are uh, actually reaching out to very practical questions now. What experiences of Norway might be important to share uh, for Georgia? Where this uh, uh, Nordic, Norwegian experience assistance programs might be especially useful? Yes, please, Shako. I'm interested in stages uh, of planning uh, implementation, and especially uh, where interesting is a uh, stage of recovery, recovery of landscape, and ecosystems. Kirsten Westgard. The developer has to propose a program and then the authorities have to uh, agree to this and they do all the studies and then submit it to, uh, to uh, the authorities. And in know it's kind of a one, um, what do you call it? One shop stop <laughs> that uh, you, you go to one authority, they coordinate with the other uh, agencies. And so there are quite a few uh, practical things that the developer has to do. Uh, and we think that the, they can uh, bear quite uh, high costs because uh, they, when once the power plant is running, they do get a good profit for many, many years. So it's a kind of a balance. If they use the national resources, they have to invest also in, in a sustainable development of this hydropower uh, plant. Lina Blut Hagen. Uh, in Norway, we had a, uh, it's not in, in use anymore, but we, uh, when it came to planning, uh, I, I think it was uh, it came uh, as a result of the, of the first uh, social unrests uh, in the 70s. Uh, where all the uh, all the rivers uh, and possible hydropower sites in Norway were classified, uh, and then there were some that could be developed, and there were some that should be developed. You know, it was a classification of all the rivers. Now we have moved on from that plan, but but in the time that it came, it was very important for the for the. Uh, the national view of, of how how to do hydropower it was it was a big discussion of course but it was um, it was quite important uh, the main uh, topic of our nordic talk uh, how to make maximum of the nordic uh, clean uh, energy knowledge professor murman margvelashvili 
As for the Norwegian knowledge and experience, there is a whole wide range of different issues, like starting from hydrology, optimization of uh, different uses of water. It can be climatology and uh, weather forecasting. It can be the quality of construction and planning and design. A lot of different things that, that are the part of now very uh, developed uh, professional system in Norway. I would suggest that, you know, cooperation also in uh, research, in geosciences research. Please, Kirsten. I think it is a very good idea to uh, promote academic cooperation uh, with the academia in uh, Georgia and in Norway. So we will be happy to uh, introduce you <laughs> to uh, some uh, people we know. An idea could be to have a, a commission who could look into uh, various aspects of hydropower. And uh, if you do that, we can welcome you to study tours to Norway. A partnership in applied sciences are very important, but also extremely important partnership uh, in fundamental sciences. Especially in Norway, you have very old and strong school of hydrology and glaciology. You can come to Caucasus. We have younger mountain system, very interesting uh, rivers. Uh, uh, what do you think about this potential? Kirsten Festkart? Absolutely feels that we could go into. So thank you for this uh, input. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I hope we, we, we will have a chance to work with uh, glaciologists too, because uh, you have very, very good school of glaciology. And uh, unfortunately, in Georgia, we have almost no, 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 no new generation in this field. It's very important, especially today, uh, at the time of global warming. Hey, could if, I comment here? Yes, please. Professor Otbjorn Bruland. Yes, um, just the things you're talking about now is one of the key aspects that we have been focusing in Norway for the last 30 years, maybe how to est how to uh, estimate the snow reservoir in the mountain to have a good or secure planning for the next seasons. So this is things that I think you could benefit from a lot. Uh, we also included it partly in our education, but I think there is also an opportunity for for doing more, for in, going into research projects. On behalf of Caucasian Journal, I wish to thank everybody for taking part. And uh, please thank accept you. our best wishes for success and good health.